Hi everyone. Thank you for those who have made it so far. Um, I'll give it another five minutes, although um, Thomas and Raphael have let me know that they'll be running 15 minutes or so late. Um, so Dennis, if it's okay with you, I might change the presentation order and ask you to go first, if that's okay. Yes, yes, sure, Claire, hi. Fab, so if we give it five more minutes just to let everyone get in that's, that's sort of making it for three and then when um, Thomas and Raphael come, I, I'm assuming they're, they're fairly caught up with the work you've been doing. Thomas yes. and Raphael. Yeah, fab, so yeah, if you could um, use the first sort of 10, 15 minutes to, to bring the rest of us up to speed, then when they get here, we can move into the wider part as well. Uh, Wes won't be able to join us today, unfortunately. He's um, He's been triple booked. And here was me thinking that between um, Thanksgiving and, New and Christmas was supposed to be quiet. Uh, but he has um, got some comments he will be sharing with the um, with the email th um, about the core documents. Um, but yeah, I'll give it five more minutes and then we'll kick off if that's okay. Okay, we haven't had any new joiners in the last few minutes. Um, Dennis, would you be happy to kick us off? Um, yes, yeah, okay. I want to share my slide, so I, maybe I have to... Uh, do you see my request to share slides here? I do, I'm just trying to work out how to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's we've got it. We've got it. Um, that's so that's a challenge coming up then. Uh, okay, select slides. Uh, just a sec. Ah, uh, sh should I send this to you first or, because what I see I, some slides? What I would suggest you doing in the bottom panel on your screen where you've got your mute button and your send video, if you press share screen, that should allow you to just share your screen with us. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, let me check. Is it working now? Yes, we have that lovely screen within a screen box. Perfect. Yep. Asset schema architecture. Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. So we've been working with Thomas on the, the asset schema. So the asset schema is the format to define the assets that would be uh, part of the exchange in SAP. So next to the the, the formats themselves. Sorry, Dennis, the before we carry on, something I always forget every single one of these sessions. Could I ask someone to um, take notes and minutes, please? Yeah. Um, anyone able to take minutes? Anyone at all? Well, I can, uh, if you don't mind, I can take in the minutes. Yeah. That would be very kind. Thank you so much, Raja. Thanks, yeah. Raja. Okay, your tennis, my apologies. <laughs> yes. So, Claire, you tell me when you want me to start. Yep, yeah. yeah. if uh, Raja is ready to go, then, then cracking. Thank you.
Yep, I would go for it. Okay. So last time during the ITF meeting uh, 11.8, uh, we discussed about the, the asset profiles, which is the definition of what could be the structure of the assets that will be part of the exchange between gateways in, in SATP, right? So here we are having, uh, I've been doing some work on what would be uh, the way to structure the architecture around the asset uh, schemas, so the asset profiles, in order to be able to include this in the in SATP. So what I want to do is not to go deep in details on what we're doing, but more share with you the basic concepts of, uh, of our work. So starting with the gateways <coughs> that we all know. So as you see, gateway one, gateway two, are the two gateways as we describe them in the in the flows in, in SATP. And the gateways rely on networks in order to fetch the assets and execute the SATP protocol. So what we are uh, introducing here with um, the suggestion that we're having here with Thomas is to introduce another concept, which is the registry. Uh, and the idea is that inside the network we have assets. The assets get transferred through SATP, I mean through gateways using SATP protocol. And the registries are uh, some uh, services that are uh, used in order to store schemas. So the schemas are the definition of the assets. So they are the asset profiles. We call them schemas because it's more compliant with this uh, notion of describing the structure of an asset. So the gateways access the network to transfer asset instances. Uh, and they doing that by executing SATP protocol with a remote gateway, G2. In order to be able to understand the structure of the asset, the gateways access registries, either their own registry or remote registries. So they can retrieve the asset schemas in order to be allowed to verify that the asset instance complies with the definition of, of its asset type, which is the asset schema. If you want to ask questions, maybe it's better if we stop and, and have questions immediately. So I'm not going through all the discussions and uh, then we have questions. So please interrupt me. I cannot see you because I'm running the slide. So uh, you can jump in the, the discussion uh, whenever you want. Uh, what I would suggest yeah. is we use the hand raising tool and then I can manage the queue from, from this side, Dennis. Uh, so yes, please, Claire, can you do that? Because I yep. don't see, right. I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, Wager has a question. Yeah, well, yes, thank you, yes. Denise. Uh, I have a question about these uh, registry, uh, mm -hmm. uh, RG1 and RG2, the remote one. Yes, uh, yes. So so uh, who manages these registries and how are these registries uh, kind of synchronized? So the uh, there uh, so there are two questions. Who is managing them? So regis the registry is potentially a service. It can run on top of a network or it can be on, on a different network. It can be a network itself. But the, the idea here is conceptually the registry is a service. And the, the, the basic uh, construct and um, uh, function of this service is to share the schemas of the assets. So you go to the registry and you declare uh, schemas. There might yeah. be one global registry for all the gateways of the world. Or we can imagine that we can have registries that are connected somehow to gateways or networks, and there could be many. Here in the example, um, we are assuming that gateway one has its own registry and gateway two has also a different registry. So in order for gateway one to understand what is the structure of the asset to be transferred to network two, it has to fetch eventually the definition of the asset schemas inside the remote registry uh, attached to the gateway too. If I understand your question, I mean, is it yeah. answering your question? That's my first question about who manages, right? So <coughs> you say it, it's a service. And, and that question is that who provides this service and how is this registry service can be trusted? Yeah, so the same thing is about gateways. I mean, who's managing the gateways and how we can trust the gateways. So it's the same thing. Uh, I don't 
think that we having uh, something which is uh, asks is asking more than what we have to answer ourselves uh, regarding the gateways. It's just that we are separating, uh, we're introducing this concept in order to separate the schemas from the instances. So inside the network, you have an asset and you would like to transfer it from one network one to network two. So you go from gateway one to gateway two by executing SAT P. Here we are saying that on top of that, there is a registry service where you define the, the schema. So the structure of the asset instance to be transferred. So if you would like to say, uh, for example, that I'm having, I don't know, uh, tokenized derivatives, I mean, on, on gold, for example, and you would like to see what is the structure of this asset, you have to fetch the schema of the asset and you have to go to the corresponding registry. So if you are in the network one and you have an instance and through the gateway one, you would like to transfer that asset instance, you should be going to the registry, the corresponding registry in order to fetch the definition of what is the type of that specific asset. That's what we call asset schema. Okay, so the uh, the trust uh, scope of a registry is the same as the gateway, right? That Potentially, that... yes, potentially. potentially. Okay. Uh, I mean, the thing is, th those who are managing the asset instances, so those who have, uh, you know, uh, originated the instances inside the network are those that have to somehow um, be part of the registry. So whether there is the same legal entity that is managing the registry as the legal entity that's managing the gateway, this is an open question. We don't know I yet. See. Yeah, okay. But there is a service I mean... where, where you define the asset schemas and there is the network where you have the asset instances. And as, as we say here is that an instance has a reference to its schema. So you can understand uh, you can verify that the asset instance complies with the schema. Okay, so you have RG1, RG2, and that's my second question, right? And then I would suppose that uh, Gateway 1 may have some uh, registry that, that this gateway can modify. It can, there, but there's a read and write, right? And I think yes, read maybe yes. can be read and, by and, any. And yes, yeah. this is also explained in the next slide. So. Okay. Uh, let's carry on on the yeah uh, and if this is not answered then then we can we can go uh, through the questions again so yeah, let me say we have sorry. network gateway registry so inside the registry yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. sorry Claire your screen is no longer being shared no it's not oh um, let me see Ah, no, it's just to, to share. Yeah, okay. Um, I requested the screen sharing. Perfect. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes. All right. So, moving on to the uh, the next slide on, on the concepts. So inside the registry, we have the schemas, the providers of the, the assets, and what we call the schema definition authority. So the schema defines the type of the asset, as we said before, the asset instance. So there is the structure of the attributes of the asset instance, and eventually other capabilities related to the constraints eventually of uh, who can, I mean, in which network the asset can run, if it is transferable, if it is taxable, other capabilities, as we discussed during uh, the previous I, uh, EFF meeting. Now, the the schema definition authority is the legal entity that actually signs the asset schemas that are stored in, the, in a given registry. Signs in terms of the cryptographic guarantees that the specific schema uh, is authorized to be part uh, of a legal uh, jurisdiction. So if an asset schema definition authority recognizes an asset provider uh, as a provider that is able to issue uh, instances in a given network, then the schema has like a legal uh, authority in a specific jurisdiction managed by the, the definition authority. 
So the provider can issue asset instances if it has the issuance authorization by the relevant asset schema definition authority. Basically, what we say here is that the schema definition authority is the legal entity that says that the specific asset schema could be used to issue assets instances on a given network for a specific jurisdiction by an asset provider. Okay. So I don't know if you have questions on that. I can yes, eventually show the uh, sequence diagram and then I will go to the governance principle. Yes, please. There's so, no questions. Thank you. Okay. Assuming that you have a schema definition authority that is declared on the registry, so we know that uh, the specific legal entity is the asset schema definition authority if we I go to uh, the registry. I also have an asset provider that is also declared in the registry. And then I let's assume that we have a schema that is issued and stored in the registry by the asset schema definition authority. Then what are the steps for an asset provider to issue an asset instance? First of all, it fetches the, uh, the asset schema. It goes to the asset schema definition authority to request, um, you know, the uh, the ability to uh, issue an asset to that specific schema definition authority. And if the asset issuance authorization is given for the specific schema by the uh, the definition authority, then the asset provider can issue the instance on the specific network. If we do that, then we know that the specific asset instance, it has legal validity if it follows the asset schema for the given jurisdiction and the issuance authorization is given by the definition authority. All right. I don't know, Claire, if we have questions. No, no questions. Okay. So that's the basic concept. So, of course, we're going to continue to elaborate on that and we're going to email all this in the, uh, in the mailing list. Now, there is one uh, thing that has to do with the governance. Actually, what we are um, contemplating here with uh, Thomas, it's something which is quite open. So you can have the schema definition authorities that can freely register themselves in a registry as well as the providers that could be legal entities or physical persons. They can also uh, freely register themselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a registry without having any sort of central organization that allows the, the writing on the registry. It is basically something that follows the principle that we discussed in previous ETF. It's that if a gateway trusts the specific legal entity, then it can continue to execute the sub -P transfer. So the asset schema definition authority signed the schemas. So in terms of the consistency and the integrity, we know that there is a specific schema that has been somehow approved in a specific legal jurisdiction by the definition authority. All the asset schemas are registered and there is no uh, removal. They are all append uh, in the registry with new versions. And if an asset provider has an issue as authorization, then it can use the schema to actually issue and originate asset instances in, in the specific networks. So you have a trace that this asset has a reference to a schema that has been authorized by the specific definition authority, asset schema definition authority. So that's in a nutshell the, the concepts that we are, uh, you know, introducing. So all of that is going to be uh, shared in the, in the mailing list. And we are uh, looking forward to issue the, uh, an RFC soon um, that captures all these concepts, both in terms of the asset schema definition and the asset schema architecture. So that's all, Claire. Uh, I don't know if you have questions. Uh, we just got his hand up. Yeah, Denise. So go back to the first question: the, the synchronization yes. of uh, yes. Uh, yes. instances, asset schema instances stored mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. So after yeah. kind of going through this, it seems that the schema itself is defined by authority. Probably it's stored in the authority database, and then the instances are in the registry. And then they go back to the first, the the, the second part of the first question. 
And how are these instances uh, kind of synchronized? And are they, do they need to be a single copy? What if the two copies are in two registries? When do you want to get the instance, where do you find yeah. that instance? You have, you have unique references anyway. So if we have multiple registries, we may not avoid the redundancy. However, the, the asset schemas are, uh, you know, definitions of, of types. So, if I have to, uh, let's refer to, for, for example, if this is an equivalent to verifiable credentials, is the definition of the verifiable credential in JSON-LD, for example. But there are more than that. It's also the fact that uh, you qualify uh, the legal jurisdiction of the specific asset. You have to define things like uh, if it is taxable, other capabilities, uh, like if it's confiscatable, other uh, capabilities have to do with uh, whether it could be transferred to a specific network, target network or not. So um, there is, and also Thomas is also, um, you know, making a comment here is that uh, we have to define the asset schema like a class in the object-oriented world. Now, subclasses of that schema are industry-specific. As we say in the last ETF, you can have, I don't know, uh, supply chain asset schemas, you can have uh, DeFi asset schemas, you can have, I don't know, in, in other domains, uh, schemas that define specific asset, types of assets. Um, so what we try to capture here is the fact that if you go and fetch a specific instance of an asset in a given network, you have to somehow find what is the type of this asset. And that's what we capture in, in a schema. So the, the, the schema is not the specific smart contract as shipping is asking here, if it is an ERC-20 or 721, is semantically what is this asset behind the interface of an ERC-721. I don't know, Thomas, if you want to jump in, uh, I think that you are, you are writing comments. So, I mean, if you would like to say something. Uh, sure, can can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so, um, uh, so the, 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 there's, so shipping, there's like two, two stages, if not, if not three stages, right? So, so far the blockchain community has focused on the third stage. And what, what we're saying is that if if there's an asset schema which is just a think of it as a piece of paper that that says okay you know the eu jurisdiction recognizes this set of asset classes okay and so if you are a, you know a business wanting to issue assets you say well that's great but we need more details and so the profile comes in so i think we we contemplate possibly industry specific profiles so for example People who are doing exports of iron ore, for example, I'm thinking of you know Australia, Brazil, and so on. They might get together and say, "Why don't we just do, develop our own iron ore asset profile specifically for our consortium, for example, or our industry would be better." Right? Yeah, so, or a bill of lading, for example, in supply yes. chain would be also a definition of an asset, for example. Yeah, and, a, a, a. And, and the goal is just to basically it's it's not really well. Okay, it helps automation, but is to provide consistency across the globe, right? So that if if I say, um, you know, a ton of iron ore here in the United States, it means exactly the same thing in Australia, in Europe, in Asia, right? But but today, all of that stuff is off chain and it's very industry specific, right? And there's, there's a dis disconnect between, uh, you know, um, the, the smart contracts on the blockchain with that world. And the EU recently published the MICA regulation, right? The ART tokens, you know, that's kind of just the first step, right? It just says ART token, it has to reference an asset that's, you know, off chain, but like, how, how do we do that? And what is the semantics of this asset? I mean, what and what's the be... semantics of this asset? Right? Yeah, so if we like so to this is, yeah, this is like still exploratory, we just, so if you, if you have anything, that you see in the Ethereum space, I mean, we'd love to hear about that. The thing that we'd like to do here is to capture the things that are not 
necessarily the interface of how you manipulate the, the asset, but more like what the asset is, which is something that is not defined in ERC-721 or ERC-20. It, it's just what, what is the, the structure of that. So, so if it was in an object-oriented world, we would say, what is the definition of the class of that specific uh, instance of asset? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we have a hand up in the queue. Um, if I get it correctly, Thomas and Dennis, uh, it's a kind of way to describe a kind of a product, um, like an ore or some kind of cargo. You have this kind of template to describe it. Yes, a, a template is a good yes. one. We, we yes. don't want to say yeah. a template, but yes, for, for test yeah. purposes, yeah, it's a template. Yeah. Right. So the, the, yeah. yeah, please go on. No, the thing is, um, besides the way it, to manipulate the asset, which is the definition of what, what the smart contract is, is basically what is really behind the uh, the asset. So the the kind of attributes, the kind of uh, you know the the data structure of this of this asset. Uh, what we used to call you know the, the 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 class in terms of the ontology definition of the class, but we don't want to go to RDF or any other you know heavy stuff like this. It's just that we, link, we need to understand and having one common way of understanding the, the, what is the type of a specific asset that exists in a given network. Cool. So my question is that uh, if you have this kind of asset schema and, uh, uh, well, you have, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you have this kind of schema registry to keep track, like what are the current accepted schemas? So when you do like updates to those kind of schemas, uh, you specify the uh, modification process, the deletion process. But do you, when you modify it, you create another mm -hmm. one instead, or just keep a yeah. you have some way of version control, keep this schema, you know, uh, in a in a controlled yes. way. So first of all, because we are in a in a kind of networks that might have history, like blockchains and DLTs you cannot remove stuff because otherwise you will uh, blow the consistency of the whole thing. So you need to keep adding things. So there will be uh, successive versions and the schema definition authority uh, would say that from the specific date, if you would like to have the, typically a bill of lading uh, expressed, you have to use the new version of the schema, but you have also for backward compatibility reasons, the previous schema register on the registry as well and cannot be removed. So you just keep adding, appending uh, new versions in the in the registry. Well, well yes, I, I get the, you know, it's a pen only ledger, but uh, when you, when it's similarly, when it's using the other kind of transparency service, when they keep track of this, these kind of, uh, you know, public information, uh, they usually, you know, for the ease, uh, for the ease, for the searching and indexing, the latest to retrieving uh, the latest information. Usually, when you're having this kind of service, you kind of pre-index those information from the blockchain and mm -hmm. uh, keep it, you know, more easy for people to prove or to retrieve the latest, and also to keep look if there's like a trace of history. If, if it's, you know, uh, you know, managed, it could be better, more friendly for the users. Just, just absolutely, like, absolutely, and, and yeah. you have also the semantic versioning of the uh, uh, of, of the asset schemas. It's something that it's probably something that we would need, so you can have, you know, the three-digit semantic version with major, minor, and patch, eventually versions that can exist uh, out there there might be also in the registries a part that is on chain and a part that is off chain uh, because i'm assuming that if we're using public ledgers for example the cost of storing uh, large uh, data structures in json or for example uh, that, that might be costly so there might be implementation for registries that may having a part that is off chain but still the consistency of the whole thing depends on the fact that we have an identity that is definitely on chain and there might be extra information that is stored off chain. And this is how we implement the registries, which is not something that I have uh, presented here. It's something that is still to be discussed if I answer your question. Cool, yeah. Fab, thank you. Um, Baji, do you have another question? I'm not sure if hands still up from previous. Yeah, yeah, I have another question. Yeah, I think talking about this uh, template, right? Uh, Chunqi mentioned about template. I think there's a 
another work by Microsoft and EA and other companies uh, called the uh, token taxonomy. Uh, they define the, the the schema and the the classes and then the instances uh, in this to uh, the token the taxonomy. Uh, basically, yeah. it's, it's very similar to this. They have a template, they have a class, and then they have instances. And then yes. the difference is that yeah, you know yeah, the difference is that anybody can issue a, a, a token schema and can define token schema and define uh, classes and then instances as well. And I think the proposal here is like a more centralized. You have authority to to kind of issue no. define the schema. Uh, actually, no. There is anyone can can uh, define schemas in a registry. Uh, the fact that you may have some specific authorities that accept the schema and sign the schema because they are in a specific legal jurisdiction and they can uh, voice an opinion about what would be uh, the specific schema for the specific jurisdiction. This is a different thing. You can always register. Um, so typically, if we have private um, uh, companies that are registering schemas in order to do transfers um, that are very happy to do by a mutual agreement, that's fine. You don't have to have a specific authority. However, if you would like to have legal, uh, you know, uh, backing on the specific schemas, because there are taxation, because there are many other things that ha have to do with the uh, legislation, then you should probably want to have a schema definition authority that says that this is the way to define asset instances in networks if this is bound to a specific legal jurisdiction so it is totally open and totally permissive and we should not have any sort of centralized governance actually it's the opposite we would like to have it open and whether you you trust a party or you use a schema it depends on the mutual agreement between the two parties as we always said in sat p if i understand uh, what your question was Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think the diagram seems that you need to have authority to approve it. Uh, so I say so anybody can define. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the authority is because you would like to have legal, uh, you know, uh, context. If you are perfectly fine because you have a transfer between two, you know, private uh, parties, and the gateways can uh, agree that this is the schema to do to use, that's fine. It's perfectly fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, Dennis, and for the quite lively discussion we've had about that. It's been really, really useful. Um, if we have no objections, we're halfway through this session now, and um, I know there's another update coming from Thomas from the design group. Um, does anyone have any objections to moving on, or is there anything else to cover? Okay, thank you. Um, Thomas, over to you then. Claire, uh, should I um, uh, uh, so did, uh, should I show my screen or should I show the SAP P forty one says the available documents? Um, the deck is showing that it's being shared. If you give it a minute, if it doesn't kick in, then um, do as Dennis has done. It's, oh, there you go. It's, it's, there. It, <laughs> it's there. Version two or is it version one? Um, that is a great question. Um, I will wait for you to tell me. <laughs> okay, let's have a look. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's uh, we can we can we can talk through it. So okay. so um, uh, uh, th thank you, Claire and uh, uh, folks. Just giving an update about the network identification work uh, that we've been doing. You know, with a lot of contributions from uh, Wager. So just a quick uh, recap um, on the last uh, design team call. We kind of agreed that you know gateways before gateways can even begin to do the transfer commands it needs to definitely know the the addresses of the originator and beneficiary i think we knew that from the beginning um the network identifiers which is why we're even looking at this problem for sure and then um the gateway endpoint identifies itself right because each network could have multiple gateways and so if you know this particular you know gateway number 67 in network one is going to appear with gateway 55 in network two then you know 67 and 55 need to be definitely identified many reasons among others this is 
all this is going to be input into computing the the context ID, which is an application level structure, and also at the network level, the session ID. And this is important because uh, Alice and Bob could, in fact, run concurrent transfers, uh, you know, in, in the unlucky case over the same gateways, you know, 67 and 55. And so these gateways need to know that these are separate, unrelated um, sessions, and, and therefore, um, the, the session ID is uh, very important for that uh, circumstance. So, um, uh, so this is when we're talking about um, uh, layer one, uh, we uh, stumbled upon the, the problem of of layer two. So, so uh, for those who don't know, layer two is a new structure construct that that the idea primarily is to speed up uh, the the processing uh, that you know many layer one blockchains may find. You know, may, may, people may find you know being too slow, and so um, you know, so far in our group, we've uh, we've been looking at you know we've been assuming the peering and the networks are layer one networks, right? And so if you look at you know the the lock assertion, you know in 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 the in the middle phase stage two, and in stage three there's a final receipt. Um, those are written with the assumption that there is this you know layer one ledger and that the layer one network has a unique identifier and so the qu the question for the group is like you know you know should a gateway in g1 really care about whether or not the remote network is a uh, layer two or layer one so, you know so long as uh, there is some guarantee there's some assertion coming back from the other gateway a side assertion saying that yes you know Thing, this has been, uh, you know, the, the, the asset has been, uh, you know, um, burned on the origin network and, and vice versa, the asset has been created. So this is an interesting um, question, I think, that, that we need to look at. And I, I, I tend to think, and we'll see in the next slide, assuming I have the, next, the correct slides, that, um, that maybe the gateway shouldn't, shouldn't care because it's a signed assertion. So the gateways who, who, the gateway who's doing the signing and issuing of the assertion is um, you know, legally you know, on the hook. So, so this is kind of the, the diagram uh, for those, I'm just using the generic terms, you know, roll up and sequencer. So a layer two network uh, typically, you know, think of it as a, you know, a bunch of computers and they're doing you know, very fast processing. And for, the, for those who know, the lightning design for uh, Bitcoin. That's a that's a nice example, an early example of what what you know off chain uh, layer two uh, computation looks like. But in this case, what this diagram is trying to show is, uh, so far we've been looking at gateway G one and G two directly, you know, peer to peer la layer one to layer two. But is it is it possible that the SATP um, also, in fact? You know, support the case of G1 talking to G4, where G4 is in fact a layer two um, network, and it's it's going to be uh, all the the transactions are going to be rolled up down to network you know N2, right? And I I tend to think uh, we're still thinking about it. I tend to think yes, SAPI should just work, you know, just fine, you know, so long as the the rules are observed, you know, assign a search and so on. But that brings the question of well, how do you identify, uh, you know, layer one and layer two uh, network ad identifiers, network, uh, you know, distinct identifiers. And this is this is where uh, wages emails, um, you know, for um, uh, you know, for um, I, I think I have the wrong slide, but it's okay. So 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 let me skip to um, so that we have a discussion. So this is from the last. Um, you know, interim meeting. Now, uh, the proposal from Wages email uh, is that um, the 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 network identifier, if it's a layer two, will use the layer two for the front bit. You know, for the for the um, uh, for for this for this middle bit. So byte byte two all the way to byte thirty is your layer two network identifier, but uh, the Layer two must also include the parent layer one where the rollup occurs. So effectively, the metadata is carrying a layer two address, 
the, the, the complete thing is a layer two address and the metadata is carrying a layer one address, right? So it's both. And so when a gateway is seeing this, you know, if gateway G1 is talking to um, what was before G4, um, you know, in the previous diagram, it can immediately see, okay, well, the, the G4 gateway is, is advertising a network that is using, uh, it's a type one using extended length mode. So that means there's metadata. So it reads the metadata and says, well, oh, there's another address behind the metadata and that's a layer one address. So implicitly gateway G1 knows that it's in fact dealing with a layer two network, just through the fact that these, these two almost concatenated sort of addresses. So that's kind of that's kind of the, the design. Um, um, I want to give Weiji. Do you want to jump in and and correct me if I missed anything uh, in this discussion? Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Yeah, you are exactly right. I just want to maybe describe a bit in detail why we come to this uh, kind of proposal. Right, uh, there are so many uh, permutations there. Uh, so uh, first, you explain that uh, layer two has dependency on layer one. All the transactions that are on layer two has to be verifiable on layer one. So that 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 is what layer two is about. And there are many kinds of layer twos, right? There's a geo knowledge layer two, there's a relayer layer two, there's a kind of proof based uh, layer two, and then also the challenge based layer two. So there's no way you can uh, define a layer two as a, as a type itself. It, layer two can be anything, right? So it, it, it doesn't make sense to have its own type. So that, that's why we say that treat layer two as layer one, because it, it, it has it can be all kinds of things. But at the same time, we want to associate that layer two with a layer one, right? And with that 32 byte, we probably cannot do that at all. So the best thing is to put it in the metadata. So what you want to do is very simple. You just use the unity identifier to identify this layer two uh, chain or, or system. And then you associate this layer two with the layer one by labeling uh, L1, for example, L1 table equal to something like uh, like this layer two one identifier. That way you have both the identity for layer two and then the association of layer, layer two with a layer one. So that solved the problem. And layer one doesn't need to, should not uh, have any association with uh, any layer two. Because you cannot say that I'm layer one and I have these many layer twos. You cannot do that because anybody can build a layer two on layer one. So there's no association from layer one to layer two, but there are associations from layer two to layer one. Yeah, and then the, just uh, format is very simple. Just extend that uh, association through this extended field. Uh, so I have a question, uh, Weijia. This is worth uh, um, you know, uh, talking about. If you go to that diagram, right? Yeah. So if if uh, G one is talking to G four, and part of the SATP exchange is that um, it's 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 moving an asset from network one to you know uh, essentially network two, but via uh, you know network four gateway G four. And so in the flows, in our flows, we have that in, in the last third stage, the receiving gateway has to issue a, a receipt, a signed receipt that's, that basically says, yes, the asset has been minted on um, network two. C can we assume uh, in most deployments of layer two networks that gateway G4 has access to the ledger of the layer one network, in this case, network N2? Yeah, I think uh, it's a bit challenging there, uh, like optimistic, right? Uh, because uh, sometimes for security reason, they waited for a week for this asset to be to be redeemed on layer one. And I think you have to, we have to deal with finality here. Um, so I think that's 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 one thing that I'm not sure here. How do how do you wait? How do you confirm this thing is executed on the on the G? Uh, you said uh, N four there, G four, G four there. So and that's one thing. Second thing is that uh, can do you have a, a set? Uh, 
let's say TP from G1 to G3, do you support that scenario as well? Because technically you can also have a transaction from G1 to G3, right? Yes, I mean, I, 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 I thought about that yesterday, and I'm, I was afraid to ask because that would be so complicated. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then if you support that, then there's a loop there. So well, this loop, you have, you can have G one to G four, G four to G three, and then G three to G one. Technically, you, sh you, sh you should be able to do that. Uh, and then you have a loop. And how do you maintain the consistency over there? And that's why I think I'm struggling also here. And then the, there's a there's a finality there. Because how long do you wait uh, to ensure that the other side is 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 finalized? Yeah. Uh, so so part of part of the architecture document discussion, I think it's still there. But th at least uh, the version before that, this this idea that that networks should exchange with each other some parameter of the uh, you know average you know settlement time. You know. So if it's you know, you know, whatever it is, Bitcoin. How many, how many seconds? How many minutes? If it's Ethereum, how many seconds? How many minutes? So, so that they have some rough idea about the wait time. Okay. Right? Yeah, I, I think that's good. And then here, I want to give a suggestion here. Uh, the when you uh, send uh, from G one to G four, right? And G four supposedly, uh, you should have the the L two identity and then L one as well. And I think uh, it'll be good. I think in in this bag or somewhere, you need to wait for 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 the G one, uh, uh, some events in G one or some state in G one, to make sure it's settled. And that's not, there's something that can be done over there. So that yeah. means that if you have a layer two solution, right? If it has dependency on layer one, uh, because there's a sequencer as well, it sometimes get kind of sequenced very late. And then you get settled down on the layer one very late. So in that case, when you deal with the transaction to layer two, you probably need to wait for layer one to finalize it, to, yeah, to make yeah. it settle. So, so uh, one of the uh, drafts that Rama is working on and, and wants eventually to become a work item is this views draft, which is which is just a, uh, you know, one easy way is to, to use this to verify whether the transaction has reached finality in the layer one network, right? So in fact, okay. so, G, so G1 could independently of this flow, instead of talking to G4, in, G1 knows the, the destination layer one network is N2. It could run a separate process through G2 to say, hey, you know, you know, in, invoking the views mode to say, hey, could you could you check, you know, has it, has it um, settled or not? Is it on the block? Or not, yeah, all that stuff. So that that's one of the use cases for the for the views draft that that, that Rama is developing. Oh, cool. That, that, yeah, that, that, that should solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, De Dennis, uh, you want to jump in? Yeah, the, the the thing that they also mentioned in the chat is the fact that okay, I mean, assets is one thing, but also the identification of the the parties it's an it's a very big problem between L one and L two. Typically, if you generate a wallet, I mean a public-private key, uh, it could be used s seamlessly in between Ethereum and Polygon, for example, which is L1 and L2. So you don't know basically in which network you are using the wallet because they're all valid and they can all, you know, contain cryptos, for example. You can use Matic and Ether and go in different networks with the same exact same address. It's yeah, a big challenge, I, actually. Yeah. So, because uh, Bob, you don't know in which network you have this address valid. It could be L four, a network four, and network two, exactly the same. And Bob yeah. can be in both with the same exact same identification. Well, well, so, Dennis, what if it's different? So, so Bob exists on network four, network two, mm -hmm. and Bob is using different wallets. Yes, but if, that's, two, right? uh, like, that's, the, that's, that's exactly good, the problem. Right? That, that, that's the good thing. I mean, but the, the thing is that if it uses the same address in both uh, N2 and N4, N4, it could be perfectly valid. It could be Bob, it could use the same exact same wallet, and it could be valid in N2 and N4, and it is exactly the same address. And you cannot recognize yeah. in which one uh, you, are go, you go with. Yeah, 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 Denise, and that actually justify why we want to treat layer two as the same as layer one for identification. 
because the, the, the blockchain network ID is signed into transaction. So when you send the transaction to Bob, you need to say which chain this mm -hmm. address is on. And then, Perfect. yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, so then uh, that's so, to solve the problem. Yes, yeah. yes. So the, the address of uh, what I mean is exactly that the address of the party is not enough. You have to include the network also. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any, any, any more questions, folks? Uh, oh, before I forget, uh, so the pl plan is, you know, Weiji and I are going to update the, the draft and include, you know, include this, you know, proposed solution, proposed design solution for L2 and L1. Uh, and and uh, ho hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we get that before the end of the year. Yeah. And Thomas, we have one thing that we think we want to do, but we haven't made good progress on that, which is the identification of legacy system, the SWIFT system. How yes. Do you yeah. Yes. No, thank you for reminding me. So, so yeah, this is an open question to everyone. And, and you know, Claire, maybe, you know, your team at, at Quant can, can answer this, but uh, ca can we begin working on some kind of a, you know, standard, you know, way to describe, you know, uh, monolithic uh, systems, right? So, so what we call, I think, type three, what do we call it? Type three. Uh, and, and so, so, so the, the front bit the, the, of the identifier, you know, is defined by the ITF, but the, the back bit is whatever the industry uses today, whether if it's SWIFT, whatever SWIFT uses, if it's, you know, banking, you know, UK Treasury Bank Network, you know, whatever identifier those guys use. Absolutely, definitely a question for for Luke and his team. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, Luke, Luke, and and Martin should should probably know offhand, but yes. And and of course, Dennis. <laughs> if if people in Europe, in you know, in Natba and all those places have have um, numbering. Uh, yeah, we, we need to, uh, happy, happy to, to join the, the discussion there. Yes, definitely. Uh, sorry, that's uh, sorry, Claire. That's the end of uh, my slides, unless there's um, any questions. Thank you. Um, anyone in the queue or anyone got anything to add or, or comment on from that at all or from Dennis's um, presentation earlier? No. Okay. Brilliant. Um, well, uh, we've just been taking minutes. Bless him. Thank you very much for that. I do appreciate that. If you could, um, oh, we have one, sorry. Uh, take the floor, please. Uh, yeah, just to jump in really quick. Uh, I kind of uh, added uh, several use cases uh, on the use case document. I have aligned uh, with the Rama off list and I just uh, posted, uh, if you have any time, maybe you can have a look uh, for all of you out there um this is in the list that's all thanks thank you um brilliant. okay so uh, as i said uh Bo just been uh, taking the minutes so i'm sure he'll share them with the um mailing list in, in due course um and as i said earlier wes will be sharing his thoughts on the core documents uh some really really good conversations today guys so appreciate um everyone's participation and and kind of um Engagement. This is our last um, meeting before Christmas, so would like to. Sp we've got five minutes left, so if, if no one minds just having five minutes, putting forward any thoughts on when we think our first one of the new year should be, um, as well as kind of any agenda points would be useful. Um, other than that, then it's been a, a cracking year. Well done, everyone, and um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Brilliant. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone, and uh, we'll see you in the new year. Okay. Thank Merry you. Christmas. See you in 2024. Thanks, everyone.